Welcome to you all. My name is Ben Ferenz, and I'm speaking to you from Delray Beach, Florida in February 2018. Let me first of all thank Mike Brand for inviting me to share with you some observations I have with regard to the crime of genocide and particularly to the role of Raphael Lemkin, whom I knew in my Nuremberg days. My Nuremberg days was the culmination of a series of interesting points. I was a refugee from Hungary and Romania. My sister, who was born in the same bed as I was a year and a half earlier, she was a Hungarian. When I was born a year and a half later, I was a Romanian. And what I learned was that it doesn't matter what you call the country, it matters how you treat the people. We had to flee from persecution and poverty in whether it was Romania or Hungary and found a hideaway in the United States. The Statue of Liberty welcomed the homeless, the desperate yearning to be free. My first job for my father uh, was a young man, no language, usable in America, uh, no money, uh, a wife and two little kids. He was lucky to land a job as a janitor in a tenement house in what was properly called Hell's Kitchen in New York. I'll make a quick jump from there to my applying for admittance to the Harvard Law School. I never wanted to do anything other than to prevent crime because there was crime all around me. I got a scholarship for my exam on criminal law and uh, while I was still in law school, Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor. Everybody I knew went down to enlist. I had trouble getting into any of the services because uh, I was very short. The Air Force said no, I couldn't be a pilot because I couldn't reach the pedals. A navigator I couldn't be because my sense of direction was such that if they told me to bomb Berlin, I'd end up in Tokyo. So I ended up instead as a private in the artillery, 115 AAA gun battalion. And in that capacity, we landed on the beaches of Normandy, went through the Maginot Line, the Siegfried Line. I crossed the Rhine on a pontoon bridge, driving a Jeep, which was in peril of dropping into the river at any time. I was there for the final Battle of the Bulge, and when the war was over, I went home. With that kind of a background, what relates to genocide? My last assignments during the war years was to get into the concentration camps as they were being liberated, to collect evidence of the crimes. I had done the research for a professor at Harvard who wrote a book on war crimes, so I was by that time quite an expert on it. In fact, my first article published was on criminal responsibility when I was 19 years old. And uh, entry into the camps, I don't want to describe it all to you here, I can't for one thing, it's too moving, but the horror is indescribable and unimaginable. Dead bodies lying all on the ground, you can't tell if they're dead or alive. Every disease, dysentery, lice, rats, human beings groveling into the garbage, seeking for a bite of something edible, etc. The crematorium going. With all of that, I met then in that context, Raphael Lemkin, who was a sad looking figure. He was attached himself to the Polish government somehow. And uh, we got to know each other. He gave me his book, Axis Rule in Occupied Territory, and told me that since his whole family had been murdered, uh, they had to have a special name for that kind of crime. Uh, and uh, genocide was a term that he invented. It was particularly appropriate because I was soon appointed as the chief prosecutor for the largest murder trial in human history. That was the special extermination squads that the Germans called Einsatzgruppen to conceal their identity. Their mission was to murder in cold blood every single man, German, and woman and child who was a Jew. Do the same for the gypsies and any other potential enemies of the Reich. Their daily reports, top secret, were funneled back to Berlin where they were consolidated 
and we had a comprehensive report of what they did. We captured the report, and I was adding them up on an adding machine. When I reached over a million people murdered in cold blood, including thousands of Jewish children shot one shot at a time, I flew with that down to Nuremberg, where General Telford Taylor had been assigned to have 12 subsequent trials following the International Military Tribunal trial. And I said, you have to put on a new trial. He said, we can't, we don't have the staff. The Pentagon is not very enthusiastic about these crimes. We, have, we cannot do it. I said, you must do it. He said, can you do it in addition to your other work? And I said, sure. And so I was appointed as the chief prosecutor for the biggest murder trial in human history. I was then 27 years old. I charged 22 defendants with murdering in cold blood over a million people. I used the term genocide as, although it was not listed as a crime anywhere at that time, in my opening statement, the opening paragraphs. And I appealed for the right of all human beings to live in peace and dignity regardless of their race or creed. The victims had been murdered because they didn't share the race and the ideology of their executioners. I thought that was horrible then, I think it's horrible now. And I've spent the rest of my life trying to change that. Um, the progress has been gratifying in many ways, disappointing in others. We cannot hope to change the way people think and glorify certain things for centuries in a short period of time. And uh, I was, in effect, trying to stop war making because I had seen the horrors of war. And whether you call it aggression or crimes against humanity or anything else, my f approach was to stop it. It's just too stupid what they do now. The standard is to send young people out, if the heads of state cannot agree, send young people out to kill other young people they don't even know. They then get tired, each one declares victory, they rest and they start again. That's what they do now. And they spend the billions of dollars which are needed to satisfy the complaints which drove people to war in the first place. They spend it on armaments and an arms race with the other big powers. I can't imagine anything more cruel and more stupid uh, than that current practice. And it will be up to young people like you to say that's enough. Uh, we have to think differently, it's a new world. We can now kill everybody on this planet from cyberspace by cutting off the electrical grid on planet Earth. We can do it. Nuclear weapons are already obsolete. The next war, if there is one, will make this planet the same as the thousands floating, helpless and uninhabited in space. I'm trying to give you a warning, trying to encourage you to know that progress is possible if you make up your mind. There's a role for everyone to play. If this little poor guy from Transylvania can do what he's been able to do in one lifetime, why can't you do at least as much? So there's a role for everyone to play, and I've come to talk to you and to encourage you to recognize that doing the impossible is possible. And it is possible to stop war, just as it was possible to land on cyberspace, it was possible to change the way people think about the genders, man can marry a man, and the right to vote, which was denied to American females in the American Constitution, was cast aside. All of these things seemed to be impossible at the time, but it's possible, it can be done. And certainly I hope that you will make it possible for all of you and those who may come after you to live in a calm and peaceful world, to ingrain it on your memory. People love slogans. I have the slogan, law, not war. If you could do that, how the world would change. You would save billions of dollars every day to take care of the students, to take care of the old people, to do all the other things necessary to avoid war making. And so they ask how to do it. I have three roles how you do it. One, never give up. Two, never give up. Three, I hear you, never give up. I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you very much.